Welcome to today's Oracle Machine Learning Office Hours Solution Deployment Session. Our topic today is estimating home property values using Oracle Autonomous Database, Oracle Machine Learning, and Oracle Apex with our guest speaker, Ryan Krebs of Oracle. Uh, I'm your host, Mark Hornick. Now in this session, Ryan shows us how to deploy a machine learning solution using Oracle Machine Learning in database models in an application developed using Oracle Application Express. And as you'll see, OML and Apex make a powerful combination to operationalize machine learning model predictions. So our solution deployment scenario revolves around a Brooklyn property value dataset detailing how to use OML with automated machine learning or AutoML to train a machine learning model on 15 years of historical property transactions and then use those models with Apex to estimate the market value of homes across Brooklyn, New York. The machine learning pipeline developed for this demonstration can be easily adapted for many use cases uh, faced by Oracle customers today, such as demand and expense forecasting, as well as what if scenarios. Now, before we begin, uh, let's have a quick quiz. Which of the following services are not found as part of Oracle Autonomous Database? Is it SQL Developer Web? Is it Oracle Machine Learning, Application Express, Oracle Analytics Cloud? OCI data science. Well, click all that you think apply. All right, it seems like the vast majority of folks are coming in with the, uh, the right answer. Indeed, the correct answers are Oracle Analytics Cloud. And while it certainly uh, accesses data from autonomous database and is integrated with Oracle Machine Learning, allowing you to access machine learning models through OAC, uh, it is not actually part of the autonomous database. And the other component that is not part of autonomous database is OCA Data Science Service. Now, again, OCI Data Science Service accesses data from Autonomous Database, but it's not a component of or a part of Autonomous Database. Definitely SQL Developer Web is included with Autonomous Database. Oracle Machine Learning is definitely part of Autonomous Database. And also Application Express is uh, included with uh, Autonomous Database. For our second question, can you perform real-time scoring inferencing using Oracle Machine Learning in database models from Apex. And I think we're seeing that folks have this one correct on all fronts, 100% reporting true. And indeed, you can perform real-time scoring inferencing using Oracle Machine Learning in database models from Apex. All right, well, thank you very much for participating in our polls. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan, who's going to take us through estimating home property values using autonomous database, machine learning, and Apex. Welcome, Ryan. All right, so again, thanks for the introduction, Mark. And uh, as mentioned, my name is Ryan Krebs, and I'm the Director for Data Science Business Development in North America here at Oracle. And I'm excited to walk you through an end-to-end -end demo today where we'll be using machine learning in the autonomous database uh, with a focus on predicting market prices uh, and tax rates for homes based on a given property's characteristics. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to provide a bit more context into the Oracle AI ML story. And so this is the AI ML market over the past couple of years. And this is the landscape our customers are currently trying to navigate. To be sure, it is meant to be an eyesore. <laughs> I mean, look at all these logos, right? The top left in orange is hardware and database. Uh, the middle in red and dark purple is algorithm development and the right in light purple is applications. Uh, the bottom in green represents open source products and solutions. But this red line here is all Oracle products or partnerships from the core database to software solutions. And what you'll see in the next few minutes is how all of these experiences and services have led not only to internal innovation, but as we listen to customers, an effort to consolidate many of these capabilities within the autonomous database itself. So I just mentioned the effort to consolidate services, uh, but there are also slightly different personas and workflows to consider when discussing AI and ML. And I was once told that data scientists don't buy software, which is often true, uh, but they consume it. And if they are on an internal innovation team, for example, they likely have the ear of the CIO or CDO uh, based on their need for a standardized platform for model development and deployment. And on the left here, uh, this is where the OCI data science service comes into play. It's a, a fully managed data science stack with an accelerated data science SDK in Python for managing ML ops, 
uh, as well as it having seamless integration points into the likes of the OCI Big Data Service and OCI Data Flow, which are managed to dupe and serverless Spark platforms, respectively. Uh, if a customer is more interested in quickly building out business-facing applications, uh, the autonomous databases capabilities with OML and Apex here in the middle, uh, they're going to be your best bet and your best combination of tools uh, to get the job done. Uh, these developer personas are, are going to, again, include data scientists, uh, but also your analysts and engineers looking for automation and low-code efforts around data science. And finally, if the IT shop is looking to push reporting and self-service analytics out to individual business units, uh, the autonomous database coupled with Oracle Cloud Analytics is going to be the right choice. So noteworthy here, though, is the, the fact that all of these offerings can easily plug into the AI services uh, to save the customer time to insight. So even customers who want to build their own intelligence into their applications, uh, they can save a significant amount of time by starting with the AI services, pre-trained models, and API endpoints. Okay, so to set the stage for the demo today, uh, we'll start by building out an autonomous database, uh, ingest data from an Oracle object storage bucket, prepare data for modeling using Oracle machine learning or OML notebooks, uh, initiate an AutoML experiment to build a home sales price prediction model, and finally, host and interact with the model and its underlying data in a running application. It should also be noted that while we're using uh, direct in-database inference via SQL and Apex for this demo, the OML service can also host models as REST endpoints to be used by other enterprise applications. Again, uh, coming back to the concept of consolidation and ease of use for the customer, out of the box, customers get a number of integrated services with the autonomous database, uh, but I'm gonna highlight two specifically today. First, the OML platform gives users tremendous modeling power in an automated fashion. Uh, this includes automated machine learning modeling steps like algorithm selection, sampling, identifying strong features, and hyperparameter tuning, which is just choosing the right model settings to optimize for accuracy. And the second service is the development of low-code enterprise apps in Apex for visualization and interactivity uh, that, again, are fully integrated into the autonomous database stack. But we'll go into both OML and the Apex application itself later in the demo. Okay, in the last slide, I pointed out Oracle Machine Learning. Uh, I'll take you through this in more detail, like I said, during the demo. Uh, but within the service is a number of tools to enable a flexible data science workflow. For example, the developer notebooks come with several different popular interpreters, uh, while a graphical user interface makes it easy to develop, schedule jobs, and leverage a fully automated model training capability called AutoML. And these are the individual steps in the AutoML experiment GUI. Uh, essentially, it's a point-and-click ML model generation tool, and I'll highlight its ease of use given the fact that OML pre-populates with metadata from the database. And I think that's probably one of the coolest and, and easiest features to, to work with. Okay, so the demo I'm about to walk you through answers a hypothetical question. Namely, how much does a home in Brooklyn cost given historical market trends through 2017, and how much tax should a municipality collect when taking into account these updated trends. Well, of course, that depends on factors like location, size, age of the home, sale price, et cetera. Uh, but the New York City open data set allows us to model out this scenario and analyze home sales from 2003 to 2017 with a number of home characteristics to forecast or predict sale price, at which point we can assume a given city or county's, uh, county assessor's taxation rate. And for the purpose of this exercise, the taxation rates are completely arbitrary and made up, um, but hopefully close enough to real life that the narrative holds. So finally, you can see in this image, for example, that this data has a number of variables like square footage, sale price, date sold, and even the 2010 census tract shown here, uh, to name just a few. All right, so let's take a look at the demo. All right, so we're going to start by signing into the autonomous database uh, with a simple username password. Uh, we'll end up on the uh, landing page of the autonomous database with different tiles that represent different services. So we're going to go into the SQL developer. And the only reason I bring this up now is just to show you that for this ML user, there's no data or tables on the left hand side. So what we've got to do is we've got to go into object storage and into a bucket, and we have to go get our data. So we're gonna log into the OCI console.
And in doing so, uh, we'll just come over here to the hamburger menu on the left, click storage, uh, select our buckets. And I've got uh, two buckets in my Ryan Krebs compartment. We're going to go ahead and open up the Ryan Krebs bucket. And as we scroll down, we'll see we have a number of objects in there uh, under the Brooklyn folder. We're going to have our data set Brooklyn underscore sales underscore map dot CSV. All right, so what we need to do, though, is we need to connect the database uh, or allow permissions for the database to access this bucket. And so you do that through the profile, um, the Oracle Identity Cloud Service. Uh, I'm not going to go ahead and show you the API key itself, uh, but what I will show you is just the template. So um, in the database, you'll create a credential uh, and you'll pass that credential through. We're just going to call it ADW underscore user underscore credential. Um, you'll pass your user OCID, your tenancy OCID, and then a private key that comes from a PEM file, and then a fingerprint that the API key service provides. So again, for security purposes, I'm not going to show you that. Um, but what I am going to do is just ping that credential and make sure that it's enabled. And sure enough, our ADW user credential is in fact enabled. All right, so once we know that it's enabled, uh, let's go ahead and list some objects from within that bucket. And so this uh, list objects function, we pass the credential through, we give it the URL uh, for the location of the, the bucket data, and then we execute that. And sure enough, our object name comes back. Um, so this tells us we have a good solid connection to our bucket. It's bringing back the Brooklyn underscore sales underscore map dot CSV file uh, from a name perspective. And now what we need to do is build a Brooklyn underscore sales underscore raw table for our database. And then once we've built that table, now we need to put the data inside of that table. So what you'll see here, <clears throat> this is just a um, all of the column names and the data types. And then we're going to use this create underscore external underscore table function. Uh, we're going to put the data in the table we just built. We're going to pass our credential. We're going to let it know where the data uh, resides in the bucket. And then there's some formatting that goes on as well. All right, and if we refresh our tables over here on the left, now we can see our Brooklyn underscore sales underscore raw data. All right, so that's putting the data in the database. Um, but as a data scientist, engineer, or analyst, right, I want to be able to interact with my data. Uh, and better understand it. So if we come over to our menu here on the left again, this is where Oracle Machine Learning comes into play. So we're gonna start that service up. And again, remember that uh, this does reside in the database, but we do have to quickly log in. And so we're not leaving the database. We're gonna continue to use the ML underscore user um, data and schemas, but all of that comes over with the OML service itself. So under project, we have notebooks and auto ML experiments. We're gonna quickly click on the uh, notebooks tab. And rather than create a notebook in the interest of time, uh, I'm just gonna bring in two notebooks. We're gonna bring in the explore data.json file. And then I'm going to bring in a geolocate address file. Now, just um, for clarity, I'm not gonna go into the geolocate address uh, file today. Uh, it's essentially a, a Python script our data contains X and Y coordinates for the locations of these properties. But in Apex, we wanna render geolocations through Latin long. And so that's what that Python scripts does. It, it converts X and Y coordinates to Latin long coordinates. So we're gonna open up the Explore Data Notebook. This is what we are gonna go through during the demo today. Um, the interpreter binding, uh, again, before you start your notebook, you wanna select uh, availability of the resources on the database. And so for the purpose of this demo, I don't want to get queued. Um, I want all of the resources at my disposal. So I select the high interpreter. Okay, so you can see the percent SQL that leads that cell right there at the top. Um, that tells the interpreter that we're going to run a SQL statement. And this is our first look at the data. So we're going to just pull back the first five rows. And you can see we've got things like the neighborhood, uh, the type of building. We've got the address. We've got square footage values. Uh, we've got sale price and sale date. And in total, we've got about um, 60 columns, I believe, of data. So quite a robust data set. Um, if we want to take a look at the number of, of rows that we have, 
We have a little over 303,000 rows of data. Uh, we're going to do some visualizations later, some histograms, et cetera. Uh, we're going to bring in some standard Python uh, libraries like NumPy, Pandas, and Matplotlib. Uh, we've got some, some data that we don't really know exactly um, what it represents. So we're going to bring in a count distinct uh, function for each of these. And as you can see, we've got basically for these particular columns, for 303,000 rows, we have one, two, three, four uh, distinct values. So since there aren't a lot of distinct values across the data set, probably going to drop those because they're not going to provide a lot of signal for the model. Uh, this is just a random seed generator. Uh, so that when we pull back our data for visualization right now, we get a random sample. And we have this zip underscore code and zip code column. So when we pull that back, we can see, for example, um, we might have a, a, well, we definitely have a redundant column in the data. So each of these values, as we look across those two columns, are identical. So we can go ahead and drop one of those uh, for our analytic data set. Same thing here when we run a, a SQL statement, we've got a couple of columns with two, 2010 uh, at the end of it. And so when we look at that data, uh, track 2010 and CT 2010, those two columns, while the format's a little bit different, those are identical numbers. So we don't need to bring both of those back into uh, the analytic data set for the model. But the CB 2010, that's a unique column. So we'll definitely wanna bring that one back. We'll run another SQL statement. We have two columns in the data, one called address and one called address underscore. And so when we bring that data back, um, again, looking at the first row, 272 East 40th Street versus um, on the right-hand side, 272 East 40th Street, uh, it looks like the address underscore column on the right might be a little bit cleaner because it drops those THs. Uh, same thing for the last observation, right? 1608 Ocean Parkway, comma 2A. Uh, on the right, it drops that comma 2A. So just a little bit cleaner, better data that we're going to want to give to our model. All right, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on feature engineering. I want to kind of move forward a little bit uh, and show you, you know, look, as a data scientist, right, the idea is to bring back high signal uh, data that you can feed into the model. And so we're going to bring back these high signal columns. We might build um, some case statements for categorical variables, uh, we might clean up some of the dates, et cetera. And that's what we're going to do with this Brooklyn underscore V1 table. So we're going to try to bring back some high value columns. Uh, we're going to limit the data to only those properties uh, built after 1800 or sold after 1800. And if we go back into the SQL editor here, we're just going, or the, the SQL developer, we're going to refresh our tables. And sure enough, we've got our Brooklyn underscore V1. This is kind of our first version at a cleaner, uh, more high signal data set uh, for modeling purposes. But we're not quite done. Um, so like I said, I do want to get to some of the Python that we're going to show. Uh, but here we've got um, an opportunity to, to bin based on square footage. So if you want to bring back some categorical variables um, based on square footage, we can do that as well. I want to take a quick look at this Brooklyn underscore V1 table. And two things that immediately stand out to me is the second column building class category. So we can see we've even got rentals in there on the third row. Um, probably want to get rid of that. And then um, if you look at the in the middle, the sale price column, we've got a couple of zeros in there. So since since the sale price is our dependent variable, um, having zeros for that or, or it's not particularly useful data. So we, we're going to want to get rid of those rows as well. And if we look at just the building class category, I mentioned that we had rentals in there. Uh, it looks like if we do single family and two family homes, um, they're going to be the majority of our records anyway. So let's consider building a model just on those two factors. So we're going to limit our data. Uh, we're going to create a table called Brooklyn underscore V2, and we're going to limit it to single and two family homes. So that's what our model is going to focus on. And we've got about 157,000 rows of data still coming back. So that's good. Uh, I mentioned the sale price of zero. You can see even if we just select for address 97A Cooper Street, um, that I can see already has five zeros in, in the records uh, for the data set. So it's definitely something that we're going to want to get rid of for our analytic data set before modeling. And then we've got this column on the far right called decade underscore built. Uh, just want to 
just want to eyeball this and make sure that the logic and the math is working out. And it looks like that's an appropriate uh, description of the decade based on the year built for those properties. So that's a good column to bring back. Okay, so let's get into the Python now. So by starting with percent Python, uh, that tells the cell we're going to run some Python. Uh, on the fourth row there, we've got a query, select sale price from Brooklyn underscore V2, where sale price is greater than zero. And then we're going to use the OML.sync uh, on the next line. And that's going to that's going to actually run the query for us. But we're going to use matplotlib and we're going to run a histogram. So we can see basically our, our data runs from 10 to the fifth to 10 to the six and a half, which is a sale price of 100,000 to 3.2 million. And the reason that we want to look at this in histogram format is because we want to get rid of those outliers um, on the tails uh, because we don't want those influencing our model. Uh, we're going to do the exact same thing here with gross square footage. And here again, similar pattern where it looks like our gross square footage goes from about 10 to the 2.9 to 10 to the 3.7, which is square footage from 800 to 5,000. And again, it just gets rid of those, those long tails um, so that it doesn't influence our model. If we look at the decade built, um, we can appreciate here that most of our data is going to sit after the year 1900. So basically what we're trying to do is just increase the quality of the data going into our, our model before we set the auto ML um, capability uh, loose on the data. So here's our Brooklyn underscore V3 table. This just takes into account all those assumptions that we just saw visually. So we're, we're making sure that the sale price is limited, this gross square footage is limited, and that we're, we're choosing homes built after 1900. And I mentioned the XY coordinates, right? So this is high signal data. If you look at this, when you plot it out on um, an XY scatter plot, the problem though, as I mentioned, is that it's, it's XY coordinates and not lat long. So um, that's what that other script that I'm not gonna show today uh, does for us. It brings that lat long, long back, and then we can use that in the Apex app. Okay, quickly, this is a, a Python uh, one hot encoder function. And so when I when I execute the cell, you won't, you won't see anything returned because it's just storing the function. Uh, but it's essentially taking our categorical variables and then it's gonna turn them into ones and zeros. Um, you'll see in the data here in a minute, there's quite a few categorical variables in the data set itself. And so this function, it just requires us to set a um, primary table key, which is record number, and then the target variable, which is sale price. And we're gonna execute that function. Um, and you'll see these one hot encoded variables, like the quarter that it was sold, the year it was sold, um, whether or not it's close to a particular health center, school district, sanitation district, city district, and police precinct. All right, so we're going to go into auto ML now. Um, so we have our, our analytic data set with the Brooklyn underscore V4. Uh, we've, we've already run that lat long conversion as well. Like I said, I, I didn't show that in the demo, but um, we've got the script for it. And if we go back to um, OML under AutoML experiments, we're gonna start a new experiment. So we click on create and we're gonna go ahead and call our new experiment um, sales underscore predictions. Okay, and like I said, we haven't left the database yet, right? So all of our user metadata, the schema metadata comes over and it already knows we have access to these tables. So we're gonna select the Brooklyn underscore V4 because that was our last cleanest, more high signal data that we want to put into the model. We're going to select sale price as our dependent variable. We can choose regression or classification. This is going to be a regression problem. And then our, our primary table key is going to be the record number. So that means everything else um, is going to end up being a potential feature uh, that the auto ML experiment is going to consider. So we have a couple of other variables we can change, the number of models it can test, how long um, we want to, the maximum duration. We want a high level of service. Um, that way we're not put in, in the queue. We have all the resources of the database. And then we're going to work off of the R-square metric for the model fit. Uh, we have five models available to us. Again, we just chose that. We have two GLMs. We have a neural network and two SVMs. 
And then the rest are just the features, like I said, that they kind of fall into place um, after the table key, the primary table key and the dependent variable are chosen up above or the target variable. All right, so we're gonna scroll back up and this is, this is kind of how simple this really is. So we're gonna start our experiment and we're gonna choose better accuracy, meaning it's gonna take a little bit longer, um, but we want it to run through uh, several more iterations of choosing the appropriate columns, um, and doing the hyperparameter tuning such that uh, we have the most highly accurate model available to us based on the data and the algorithm chosen. So you'll see I'm, I'm fast forwarding through time here um, because this is about a 12 minute session, but you can already start to see on our leaderboard down here on the bottom left, we've, we've completed um, the Gaussian SVM. It looks like it's, it's leading the pack with uh, 0.64. Uh, we've completed now the um, the other four, and now we've got the neural network who uh, is kind of at the top with a 0.7 R squared. All right, and so as we look down, we can scroll down as well. 12 minutes later, uh, we can start to see the, the feature importance, right? So police precincts seem to be pretty important with respect to um, that sale price. Uh, and then if we click into the model details, we can also see the, the prediction impact variables as well. And if you wanted to see the hyperparameters that were actually chosen, uh, you can go in and, and see that in Python uh, by creating a, a notebook of the model itself. So remember our model here ends in EE2, that's gonna be important moving forward. Uh, but the most important thing is that throughout this whole process, we've never left the database. Right, so if we just refresh our, our tables over here on the left, now you can see these um, these these models that we have. And so if we from from our user, if we select our models, we can see all of our model names. And sure enough, here's our model ending in EE two on row eight. And that's our neural network that led the AutoML experiment with the highest level of accuracy. So we use the prediction function on that neural network ending in EE2. And we're putting in a year sold of 2016, a 60 year old home built in 1950, and we get about a $600,000 sale price back. So it looks like our model's working, so that's fantastic. Okay, remember at the end of the day, what we wanna do is um, render all of this data in an application. And so while we are gonna uh, interact with our model directly, um, we also wanna create a table of inferences. And so this Brooklyn underscore V5 is gonna put in all of these um, independent variables, right? Here's all of our one hot encoded variables. Um, that's why you see they look repetitive. We're gonna use those that against the prediction function for EE2, and then we're gonna get a sales underscore price underscore prediction value back. And that's gonna basically be an appended column um, on our table. So I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So what we've done is we've just scored every single row in our Brooklyn underscore V5 table. And then we've added this sales underscore price underscore prediction value. So for each home, for each sale, we also have a predicted value. And I'll show you in the application what that looks like later and why that's important. Okay, so if we take a quick look at the data, let's let's just pull back the first row uh, for Brooklyn underscore V5. And this will be our first view into all those one hot encoded variables. But really what I wanna do is just show you at the end that we do have the prediction. So there's all of our original data, um, the XY coordinates, the square footage. And you can see all these ones and zeros zoom in past you. Um, again, those are our one hot encoded variables for the things like the police precinct um sanitation district etc and there's our sale price prediction at the end and that's just more of a confirmation step okay so uh i mentioned that again we're building an apex app at the end of the day right and we want to be able to interact with a lot of this data geospatially so this last table to brooklyn underscore v6 uh, that's going to do just a quick left join and we're going to add the lat longs onto the data uh, we also have some summary uh, variables like the number of times the property was sold, uh, as well as the max sale price. And so you can see um, those variables coming into our data just with a simple left join. All right, so we have our Brooklyn underscore V6 table. 
And that's going to be kind of the table of reference for a lot of our visualizations moving forward in Apex. And one of the things that I, I wanted to mention in Apex is that um, so you can you can share applications back and forth. So you can build an application and it comes out as an export in a SQL file, which is really nice. Um, so you've never really left the SQL language. And so I'm I'm not going to go down the thousands of, of rows of, of code here, uh, but it just goes to show you importing and exporting becomes um, a very straightforward process um, in just a, uh, with respect to having a, a .SQL file. So again, not having left the database, we're gonna now start the Apex service. And as an admin, uh, we're gonna create a workspace that we can that we can work in. And so we can build new schemas or we can use the existing ML underscore user schema and that's what we're gonna choose. And since we haven't left the database, it already knows which schemas are available to us. And then we're gonna create a workspace called Brooklyn. Okay, and now that we've created that workspace, we come into the development the development environment. We, we have to log in one more time because um, all we've did, done just then is just created the workspace. But we're gonna log into the workspace with the ML user uh, schema with our Brooklyn user. And this dev environment allows us to build apps, um, work directly with SQL in the database, work together as a team and collaborate or download examples in the gallery. So we wanna click on this app builder and in the interest of time, rather than creating a new one, uh, we're going to bring in this .SQL file that I have, which is our final application. There's just a couple of kind of point and clicks here. Uh, again, you just want to double check that you have the right schema, the parsing schema, which we have ML user. And then we're going to install the app. Um, we're going to install the dependencies as well. Again, I'm going to go through this pretty quick because this is um, really just bringing the application in. And rather than run the application, I want to edit it because I want to show you what we got here. So we've got six pages that that comprise our, our app. And probably the most important one here, or two of the most important one here, the first one is the um, Brooklyn map. And so what we want to do is we want to have a facet here or a, a search function where you can where you can type in the address and and it actually filters the data for you. Another thing we want to do is filter on the decade built and so you can see these static values here that allow us to filter on the decade that the property was built. And then if we want to jump into a particular range of of properties based on the sale price, uh, we we can add those static values down there. Uh, the map itself. So this is really interesting. Um, essentially, what you what you have is a query, and this query, <clears throat> you can see the top case statement here with the the n underscore transactions. That's just an exaggeration uh, for the number of transactions for the purpose of building a heat map. And then we have another two case statements here. Um, think about it this way: these two case statements are saying if our model predicts the value of the property higher than what the previous tax assessment um, uh, value was, then bring that value over because it's a potential loss for the tax assessor's office. So you're gonna come up with these um, assessor total tax losses and assessment losses for the tax office. And, and here's our predictions actually coming over. So you can see on line 40, the sales underscore price underscore prediction. Um, 41 assumes a particular, um, again, arbitrary percentage for the assessor's total. And then 42 is just a taxation against the assessor's total. So just trying to bring this into a little bit of real world context with some, um, with some percentages and estimates. Okay, so the Brooklyn map, again, it's gonna use longitude and latitude. Um, you can have a hover over tooltip. Uh, to some of these properties. And so that's just an HTML expression bringing some of the column values over. And then we're going to have two heat maps. So we're going to have the number of times sold as a heat map. And you'll see that one in uh, Burgundy and it'll be tied to that total transaction column. And then we have the assessor loss. I mentioned those two case statements. So that'll be um, teal to green and it'll be the fair market uh, assessor's total loss. Okay, so visually I'll show you what this looks like, um, but I just wanted to show you kind of what's under the hood first. 
Okay, so the next page is the sales price prediction uh, page. And you'll see these P5s, um, which basically are saying on the form that you're going to see, these are inputs that are going to go into um, a particular function based on what a user inputs on uh, in the application. And so you can see this dynamic action called predict sales price. Um, it's going to use the, the inputs from the user in the application here you see the items to submit. So that's what the function is going to expect, like building class category and gross square footage, land square footage, et cetera. And it's going to return a prediction, the assessor's total prediction, and then a tax prediction. And it does that through this, this PLSQL statement. So this top section here says, hey, in the application, these are binding um, variables. In this application, these are the things that are going to come in. We're going to give this L underscore, L underscore price, L underscore sales underscore price back. We're going to use this prediction function, recognize our neural network EE2. So that came from our auto ML uh, service. And then the L underscore price, sales underscore price variable, we're just going to add some arithmetic to that again um, to come up with an assessor's total and then a tax prediction. Okay, so we've seen a lot of code. Um, let's go ahead and I, I wanna show you what this looks like in, in, in real time. <clears throat> so we're gonna run the application. And what you'll do is you'll, you'll sign in as a user. And you can ask, access the different pages either by these icons or the hamburger menu over here on the left. But let's look at the Brooklyn map. Um, and you can see our searches over here on the left that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, the geolocation in the map is going to automatically zoom in for us. Um, we can type in the address. We can choose from the decade built. So we can see here like 1950. These are homes that were built in 1950. Um, and our map renders accordingly. We've got home prices from a quarter to half a million. We've got the heat maps where we can um, toggle on and off the assessor's loss. Um, the number of times the, the property was sold. We're going to put the heat maps back on, though, um, and we're going to take a, a quick look at, at the, the, the values that, that come up with the tooltip. So on 16th Avenue, the last recorded sale price was just over 462000 Our Our auto ML model predicts it above that at 477 and some change. Um, our, assessors, our assessor's total, the last time it was recorded, was 30000 plus. The prediction that we have based on our model is over 47,000. And so that's a tax revenue loss um, potentially of, of almost $1,000. And so you can see where the revenue office would probably want to, to better understand why they, why they potentially haven't um, increased the tax on that property. So we can, we can filter down just to, for example, properties on Utica um, with uh, properties that were built in the 1940s. And again, this is where our heat maps and our hover over tooltip come into play. So we've got here like a property, for example, that was sold five times. Um, and that tax revenue loss predict is a little over $1,000. Uh, if we look at some of the other properties on this particular street, uh, it looks like number of times sold one and a tax revenue loss of around $600, uh, tax revenue loss of around $700 number of times sold one. So maybe there's an indirect or direct correlation between the number of times a property was sold and on the market uh, and how much revenue loss the taxation office um, uh, has yet to, has yet to, uh, or uh, loss that the tax revenue office has, has yet to achieve. All right. So if we look at the housing data here, um, this is just another way to interact with the data. Uh, and so we've got just a tabular form and some filters on the left-hand side. Uh, this is our raw data. And if we want to, uh, again, it just scrolls down. If we wanna just filter on a couple of these pieces here, uh, we can go again from a quarter million to half a million and year built from 1926 to 1950. Uh, and we now have kind of a short list of the original data and we can force rank this data based on a column. So by the assessor's total. So these are gonna be the higher value properties um, based on the filters we chose on the left. And again, it just filters the data down for us. 
Okay, so this is the cool part. Um, I think the the sales price prediction, this is where we interact directly with our auto ML model. So this is our what if scenario testing. Um, so let's just take a look at the prediction for a single family home with a gross square footage of 2000, um, the same size land built in the 1940s. Uh, the last time it was assessed by the tax office, it was uh, assessed at 30,000. And then the school district is District 16. We'll leave the rest of these blank for now. But you can see the prediction for that home. Again, this data only goes up to 2017 from the year, but you got about $260,000. Uh, let's increase our land by about 300 square feet. And you can see that that doesn't really have a huge effect on the prediction um, or the assessor's prediction or the tax prediction. Well, let's change the school district and see see if that modifies things a little bit. And sure enough, you see a jump in about $100,000 in the prediction value of the property just based on changing the school district. So you can see the school districts have quite a lot of influence on that, on that prediction. Um, what if you wanted to live, for example, right at the, the base of the Brooklyn Bridge right across from Manhattan? So that's Police Precinct 84. And we... You can see already there the prediction jumps quite a bit. So you're going to pay quite a lot of money <laughs> to be able to live right across the, the river there uh, in, in from Manhattan. Uh, but again, this just gives you an opportunity to directly interact with the model, do a lot of different scenario testing, um, and then come up with, for example, the prediction, the assessor prediction, and then the tax prediction. I wanted to go really quickly back into the dev environment to show you uh, and to reinforce the fact that it's this dynamic action here this predict sales price um, and this PL SQL that does all of this for us. And so um, based on that neural network that we trained using the AutoML service, we pass in variables from the Apex application and then we come back with the predictions, um, the assessor's total predictions and then the tax predictions. All right, so I know I flew through that pretty fast, um, but I, I wanted to make sure that we we got through all of that in in a single session. But that's basically the sequence from uh, going from bringing raw data uh, from the Oracle um, object storage bucket uh, to putting it in the database to using OML to building an auto ML model and then hosting that model uh, within the Apex application for real time inference. So with that, I will pass it back over to, to Mark. Great. Well, thanks, Ryan. That was really exciting to see how we pull it all together through uh, Apex. Uh, just a quick poll at this point. You know, how has the session helped your understanding of using OML with Oracle Apex? From the choices here, you know, would you say that you learned everything that you need and will start using OML with Apex? Or you learned a lot, but you need to look for opportunities to apply this in your own projects or with customers? Was it good to learn about OML and Apex, uh, how they can be used together, but you don't have immediate needs? Or perhaps you just like seeing how you can tie machine learning in applications. Or if there was something else, uh, please specify that in the chat or the Q&A. So the responses are coming in. We see a few that are looking to use it immediately, but even the vast majority, they've learned a lot and will look for opportunities to apply this and a decent distribution through the others as well. And many just like seeing how machine learning can be integrated with applications. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And let's move on to the Q&A. Now, there were a few questions that we had, Ryan, that came in. One had to do with, you know, there are a number of ways in which you can get data into autonomous database. And you chose taking a sort of more code-based approach. Harjul mentioned that there are easier ways to pull uh, data into OS through database actions with autonomous data warehouse. Any comments on, you know, the choice that you made for doing that? Uh, no, I mean, there's certainly more time efficient and resource efficient ways to do it. Um, a lot of this had more to do with being able to visualize every single step and understand, for example, the different data types and then uh, creating the table itself. So uh, it's not it's certainly not the only way to do it. Um, and, and in particular, if you're going to do more of a, a larger data set or batch data sets, 
yeah, there are, there are other tools inside of Autonomous that, that would make more sense. Another question, when you're preparing the data, you opted to do the one hot encoding yourself, you know, do, exploding those, those columns. Was there a reason that you preferred to do that as opposed to leveraging the built-in functionality of letting the in-database algorithm do that for you? Uh, it was a function of wanting to show off a little bit of Python, really, that's all. There, Like I said, there, there's a number of ways to go about this process. For me, being able to um, go back into the database using the OML package in Python to do the matplotlib visualizations, and then to be able to just write functions uh, in Python is really, really powerful. So, um, you know, while there is a, a functionality in the database to do one hot encoding, uh, there may be other type of transformations, uh, unique transformations that you would want to do building your own Python function. So it was just a way to illustrate that. Great. We also had interest in having this turned into a live lab. Is this demo going to be part of that? And I mentioned, you know, we were just talking about this before uh, we started this session, that it's not there yet, but we are discussing how we might uh, might do that. Do you want to comment any further on that, Ryan? Uh, no, I mean, I think you, you, you summarized it. Yeah, I mean, Mark and I had a quick chat right before everybody started jumping on. I think there's a couple of other pieces we might want to tack on, um, either to the beginning or to the end of this demo, showcasing a couple of other functionalities. And so that's yet to be determined. But um, yeah, uh, looking forward to potentially getting it out there for everyone to try. And I think the last question, at least we have here, is uh, it would be interesting to see the script to get the lat long from uh, coordinates. And Joe Han chimed in also that uh, you know it was a script that he had put together, but it was sort of a quick and dirty implementation of that. Any chances of considering turning that into something that uh, you might be willing to share? Yeah, I mean, if we if we went with the live lab, I think it's definitely something that would be included. Um, to Joe's point, um, I, th I think it's a pretty slick way to take X and Y coordinates and use uh, generalized linear models uh, and and build out both the lat and long from those. So uh, kudos to to Joe definitely for building that function. But uh, it is a it, to me, it's a, a novel and interesting way to do that. And if we have some some kind of a curated workflow that we can put in a live lab. I have no issue with with throwing that in there. Great. I don't see any questions here at the moment. So I thank you all for attending. Ryan, thank you very much for this uh, engaging uh, demonstration. And until next time, we'll see you at our next session. Thanks, everybody. Bye.